It's a great uh, honor and privilege to be here. It's very nice to be in a European setting. Uh, the Secretary of State said 2020 has been a pretty terrible year. And for us, many of us in the UK, it's been a particularly terrible year because so sadly we're leaving the European Union. And so for me personally, I just uh, love to participate in European events and I'm very, very regretful of what has happened. Um, now I'm talking about social inequalities. I will be talking at the end about the local aspects, but to start with, I'm going to speak in more general terms. Um, his, let me first give a small historical perspective. If you think about the way people have talked about inequality in the past, it's usually what I would call vertical inequality or inequality among individuals. And so when people say a country is very in, unequal, they mean that the top 10%, for example, in the United States gets about half the income. And in India, the top 10% gets over half and so on. So that's what is normally meant. And it's normally in terms of income. But this neglects very important aspects of inequality. And the, there are new perspectives on inequality, which emphasize much more inequality across groups. And that is, of course, what we mean by social inequalities. In my own work, I have described this as horizontal inequalities, but it's the same. It's inequality among groups, very different from inequality among individuals, but really tremendously important. And not only have we moved beyond uh, inequality among individuals, we've moved beyond just the income dimension, as indeed the very first speaker, I think, noted. Social inequalities apply to many aspects of life, to health, employment, land, and so on. So we, we're moving to a much broader view of inequalities, and that's what we're talking about today. But as soon as one says, well, it's group inequality, the immediate question is, which groups? You can divide people into, in many, many ways into different groups. You, some are not very important. You can have people with red hair and people with black hair, or you can have people in sports clubs or people in book clubs, important in themselves, but not politically dramatically important. But some are very important because whether you're a member of a particular group determines how you're treated, whether you're treated with discrimination or favoritism, whether you have political power, how you live. So it's really important in a day-to-day -day basis and it may also determine even whether you're gonna fight other people or not or whether other people are going to attack you. And those are the sort of groups that we want to be talking about in terms of social inequalities, important groups, groups which, in which there are felt differences by people. Now, there's a big debate uh, in, um, uh, among academics and, and it's generally agreed that we don't have intrinsic differences between people which make us into one group rather than another. They are, as people say, socially constructed. They are the way we look at people, but it's not something intrinsic about the people. On the other hand, they're felt very much. And if people behave towards other people in different ways, because they're black or white, because they're an immigrant or a non-immigrant, then that difference becomes tremendously important. And how you categorize people is gonna vary according to you know, the, the subject, what, what you're worried about. Obviously, if what you're worried about is planning your school population, the group categorization that's relevant is age. But other, in other matters, other things are important. Gender is a very important group categorization everywhere in terms of justice, in terms of planning and so on. The salient groups, the important groups vary clearly across societies. Now, for example, race, it's becoming increasingly important everywhere, but it was particularly important in South Africa, for example, and very important in Malaysia. Um, religion is a way of categorizing people. Um, religion is very important aspect of people's personal lives, of their social interactions, and in the way people are treated. And we see that increasingly today. And the religious divisions have, have applied, of course, historically, they were the cause of huge wars in Europe for many, uh, I mean, a few centuries ago. 
And today they're the causes of wars elsewhere, but they're also the cause of discrimination and so on. Then we have ethnicity. Um, and this is particularly a, a way of categorizing people in, in Africa where differences between ethnic groups, again, often a source of um, conflict. We have region. And you, sometimes these inequalities are overlapping in the sense that one person belongs to a particular region, but they also have a particular religion and speak a particular language. And those ones are sort of much more difficult to treat because they're very set in because of the overlapping categorizations. So let's turn to the other aspect I said, which was new, which is we've moved beyond income. And what do we now think of as important? Uh, and uh, Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist who's had a profound uh, influence globally, wrote a very important article called Inequality of What? And he said basically inequality of all the things that people really can do, may want to do and so on. But that's a bit vague. So I think for social inequalities, we can categorize uh, the inequalities into four aspects. Economic inequalities, income, employment, assets, skills, and so on. Social inequalities, housing, education, health, your, your networks. Political inequalities, groups representation in government at local level, at central level, in the military, and so on and cultural recognition, which is basically um, the way your culture, your language, your religion, your cultural practices are treated in a particular society. Now, all of these are very important, both to people's well-being, but also because they are important instrumentally. If you have, for example, your language not recognized, then it's gonna be very difficult to get a job. In some countries, you have to have uh, you have to speak a particular language in order to be part of the civil service. Again, that's going to cause economic inequalities. Similarly, if you have educational inequalities, it's going to cause you economic inequalities. So there are a lot of interconnection across these. So why? Let me now turn to why they are important. I think it's pretty obvious that they're very important. These social inequalities, but a major reason is justice. Why should people in one group be treated differently from another group. Now, sometimes people say, well, some inequality among individuals is fair enough. Some people work very hard. Surely they should be allowed to have more income. And this is a good way of getting them to work hard and so on. So they have different aptitudes. You expect some inequality among individuals, but that doesn't apply among groups. You have these large numbers of people and there is no reason why someone should be treated differently because of their gender, because of their ethnicity, because of their color and so on. So that's the most fundamental reason. But it's also part of people's well-being. Um, if you are treated differently, it, it depresses you. And in fact, some American sociologists many years ago wrote an article which had a great title, which was called Being Black and Feeling Blue. I don't know if that translates well into German, and if it doesn't, I apologize, but feeling blue in English means feeling depressed. And then these inequalities are a source of inefficiency. They mean that we are not using the talents of large numbers of people properly because we're discriminating against them. And we're over promoting people who are of a privileged group, and then you get uh, you know, inefficient outcomes. They're also, and that's where I came into this whole subject, a source of violent conflict. Um, social inequalities are a way of mobilizing people. If people have a common identity, and particularly if they feel excluded, then they get mobilized. And you find that uh, the leaders of groups are mobilized particularly by their political exclusion because they can't get power, but others, the people who are supporting them, the followers are ex motivated both by political, but more importantly, by social and economic exclusion, because they're poor, because they see rich people of a different group. And we've got a lot of evidence that this causes conflict in different countries, um, across countries, and that the worst uh, likelihood of conflict arises where you have people who are excluded politically and also excluded economically, because then they have multiple motives for conflict. Now, there's a huge contemporary relevance of social inequalities, 
Uh, we've seen this very vividly in the US recently in the terms of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, if you look at the US, wage inequalities between blacks and whites really haven't narrowed even after 50 years of policy, which was supposed to bring them together. And then they have very uh, unequal treatment in many other respects, particularly by the police, as we've noticed. And you find similar inequalities in other countries today, which really matter. The Muslims in Western European countries are systematically deprived relative to others and treated less well. Uh, similarly, Muslims in India, Christians in Egypt, <coughs> the weaker people in China are being treated in an incredible, disastrous way, and so on. So they're hugely important today. And I've just put up a, a bit of some data on the UK because I live here and it's just incredible that the inequalities. So the death rate from COVID in this year has been three times among the black and minority um, ethnic community in Britain. And I think that's reflected elsewhere, but also black boys are 10 times more likely to be stopped and searched and so on, huge inequalities. And I'd, I've done a bit of research in other European countries and you find similar things. There's a, a, a child uh, saying, which I thought was very graphic about England, I'm getting bullied at school. People in the neighborhood are calling my family terrorists and say, go back to your own country, just a child age nine. And then another quote I have here, um, which is a more optimistic one, more needs to be done in schools to celebrate black history because it's all our history. And that is so true. And it's just not in the curriculum at the moment. So what's the source of these inequalities? Um, we know that uh, colonialism in, develop in, in uh, developing countries is a major, major source um, because the colonial powers themselves, the settlers take a very privileged position as in you see today still in Latin America, the whites in South Africa. Um, the slave trade was a huge source of inequalities, clearly migration today and refugees. These are some of the many causes of inequalities. And I think I want to emphasize that these inequalities are not just ephemeral. They don't go away just like that. They're very persistent. Some of them persist over decades. Some of them persist over centuries. It's because of persistent discrimination. It's because of cumulative causation. If you have, you start unequal, you start less educated, then you, your children are less educated too. And they face discrimination. And then it goes on and on, as I mentioned already about um, the United States. And then you have social network effects. Your group, you have best contacts within your group and less good contract contacts with other groups. But if you're the poor group, then you just meet poor people, or not only, but largely. And if you're in a rich group, then you, then you meet rich group. And so it's transmitted across the generations. So this brings me to the issue of policies. Policies to combat social inequalities are difficult to be effective because of compounding. That is because you might act on one inequality, but if the other inequality is still there, then you'll be pushed back into a sort of trap, an inequality trap. So you have to take a comprehensive view. And many policies don't do that. They just look at things individually. Um, so among the many policies, you can have direct policies, which is to say um, affirmative action type policies. You pick out a group and say, you should have privileged access or you should have less unprivileged access. You should have a quota for education in higher education or a quota for bank loans or a quota for employment in the public sector and so on. So that's a direct action, which clearly has a direct effect. You can also use indirect policies, which essentially don't name groups, but what they do is provide universal policies, which applies to everyone in the society, but they're going to be particularly helpful to deprived groups. So for example, if you were in a poor country where not everyone had access to secondary education, if you really go for universal secondary education, then you're going to close that gap between um, poor groups and rich groups. But you must make sure that the quality is the same because they have done that in some countries. And then you look at the quality of the education and you find a new type of 
uh, inequality is emerging, that the some groups are getting much less um, good schools, good quality schools, their teachers are absent and so on and so forth than others. So you need to really think about it, but universal policies can be effective. So let me give you a few examples of direct policies. You can have uh, quotas for higher education, which they've had in the United States, they've had in Brazil. In Brazil, they uh, allocate 50% of higher education places for Afro-Brazilians, which is pretty ambitious. You have quotas for the public sector employment. They've had, they've had that in Malaysia and in India. Or you can have subsidies or preferences for particular groups in the private sector, saying we will give contracts more to one group rather than another, which has again been applied in quite a few countries. Then let me think a bit more about indirect policies. I've already talked about the provision of services, but you can have anti-discrimination law, which can be very powerful if properly administered and monitored. Progressive taxation, so richer people get taxed more, and automatically that includes more of a richer group. Or you can have pro-poor public expenditure. You put the public expenditure, you, you design the public expenditure so it helps one group, the deprived group especially. So you move from spending a lot on universities, for example, to spending more on secondary education where the deprived group is. That was applies in some countries, in others it would be well, extend secondary, uh, extend tertiary education to everybody and put more money into the uh, poorer universities, and that would be another effect. And then regional policies are very powerful because very, very often regional or locational pro policies, very often groups are sort of congregate where they live. That is certainly true in Africa where particular ethnic groups live in particular parts of the country. So if you really um, try and develop, say, northern Nigeria, then you've done a lot for, for these social inequalities. Do, what's the advantage of direct versus indirect policies? Um, well, essentially, I think a comprehensive combination works best. Direct policies work pretty well, but they can cause great unpopularity and resentment among the um, losing groups. And so as time goes on, they become increasingly unpopular and are quite difficult to stop. On the other hand, they're important symbolically to show the poorer group that you're doing something and they can have some immediate effect. But the countries which have been really successful in reducing these social inequalities have combined some direct and indirect policies. And Malaysia in particular has done a huge amount and been very effective, and I'll show you a chart in a minute, with comprehensive secondary education, but also with quotas and so on. And Northern Ireland did a huge amount to correct the inequalities between Protestants and Catholics in the 1990s. And essentially that under that was the cause of the, the peace program. It enabled the peace program to occur because the very sharp inequalities had been more or less eliminated. And that was mainly anti-discrimination law, very strictly monitored and boosting the education of Catholics and improving housing. So here you can just see that the declining inequalities in Malaysia as the policies have proceeded, but this is a very, over a very long time period, 1970 to 2015, and now the inequalities are quite mild, quite modest. Well, you mustn't neglect political inequalities to ensure the fair distribution of power. And again, you can have quotas for different groups, or more indirect policies like proportional representation to ensure all groups are included. And then policies towards cultural recognition, having national holidays, including the different people's important dates, dress, language, and so on. Now, let me just come finally to the issue of um, local policies. And I know your conference is about local policies and maybe I should have spent more time on the local, but the local is very important. I here have a quote about local government is and has to be a leader and a key driver in this and its ability to translate these abstract and ge generic principles into, into practice um, is precisely, I think, what your um, conference is about. Uh, and you can have local policies at all the levels I was talking about, at the socioeconomic level, obviously education, health, housing, the coverage and quality for different groups. At the economic level, employment schemes, targeted trade tra training schemes, business support, and so on. 
cultural recognition, a respect for difference, a support for cultural activities and policies towards um, school curricula. And then at the political level, well, I guess most local um, situations, it's usually the, 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 the central government or the federal government which determines the political system. So you're probably not able to change the political system, but at the local level, you can ensure in an informal way that all groups are represented um, in uh, local political activities. So here are just to end a few examples of uh, where local initiatives have been effective um, from a range of countries. And its first is Clissold Park in Hackney, quite near where I live, um, which brings together a huge range of different uh, people from different cultures who work together, play together. Um, I should, I, I haven't mentioned it, but sport is another way in which uh, people can be brought together. Then there's an example in Tasmania, where, which, is, um, which uses sport and tries to get immigrants, uh, new migrants to play particular sports and gives them a mentor or a young person who will try and bring them into the sports. Um, then you have museums in Western Australia, looking at the culture and history of different groups in Australia. Here's an example from Frankfurt, um, an office of multicultural affairs, which has promoted political participation and multicultural events. And then again, there's a, a, a one again fairly near where I live called the Chocolate Factory. It's got a nice name, but I don't think it does much about chocolate, but it supports multicultural micro enterprises and small businesses. So there's a huge range and, and I'm sure you can all think of many other examples, but I think local authorities can do a huge amount to improve, to reduce uh, some of these inequalities in, in housing, in political participation in culture uh, and a bit in the economy. So just to leave that up, two quotes from famous Europeans about the importance of the issue we're talking about. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.